You, know, you said you were always very entrepreneurial, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you can't make money being an endurance, no. at, you know, runner. So where did you get the capital even to start Primal Kitchen? What were you doing prior? My original plan was I wanted to change the lives of 10 million people around the world. That was my original mission at Mark's Daily App. And then a couple of years in, I added a zero to it. So I wanted it to be 100 million people. You don't seem like your body's broken down. Like you look like you're very fit, that like you're still very active. You're doing yeah. ultimate frisbee. How did you even maintain that ability, given the fact that, like, especially people who are runners like you, yes, yeah. their bodies break down? So in my case, um, I got Connor Malaysia. Well, I was one of the first miracle cures with orthotics. In 1974, 75, I went back to running and racing because I wore these hard acrylic orthotics. Well, they didn't fix yeah. the problem. They alleviated the pain. I would always hear you talking about yeah. metabolic flexibility. And the other people would say, when I was speaking to Mark, we yeah. were talking about, right. right? Rob Wolf and I popularized the term mm. many years ago, and it just okay. became it became this way to describe a state of the body where you could access any substrate for energy that was available at the time or necessary at the time. So, whereas most people spend their lives just being good at burning carbohydrates, right? Mm -hmm. they, they eat a lot of carbs, they turn it into glucose or glycogen, they work out, they burn that, they never burn fat because they never get to the point where the body says, let's burn fat. Uh, Mark Sisson, Sisson sorry, is on the podcast, and um, I've been a huge fan. I just was basically like fangirling over him before we started rolling. Uh, Mark just quickly is like the OG in the health and wellness space, in my opinion. And as an entrepreneur, he had this thing called the Daily Apple. You still have it, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah it's not mm -hmm. like it's gone. Right. But it was it started in 2006, which makes it almost like it's 17 years old. Yeah, yeah. 17, and the, and still one of the best newsletters. Yeah that I've ever Thank you. read, yeah. you're welcome. And Primal Kitchen, which is in my kitchen right now. Um, so I wanna first, I'm going right, I'm just going right for the jugular. You look so good. How old are you? I just turned 70. You just turned 70. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you look like you're like 40. Oh, your sure. body well. is insane. What are you doing? I wanna know everything. <laughs> I want that, I wanna know what your routine is, what well, your regimen is. You know, um, it, it's uh, some genetics. Um, okay. You know, you cannot discount that. Um, I've been do. I've been athletic f my whole life, so I started a, a routine, a habit of working out daily in my early teens. It started with running, but I also started lifting weights in my teens. Um, I've always been competitive, uh, so the level of my athletics was was such that I would be forced to dig deep and uh, and you know find the the pain cave and mm -hmm. all of the things they talk about right now. I chose to be an endurance athlete, so I chose to first of all I was a marathon runner in the seventies. And quite a good one. And uh, and from there, I got injured after seven years of, of overtraining and beating myself up doing that. So I, I, I switched to triathlon. And so my first triathlon ever was Ironman in Hawaii in 1981. I wound wow. up finishing fourth in the 82 uh, Hawaii Ironman. But um, so I've always uh, somehow been associated with a type of workout that uh, is basically managing discomfort. You know, yeah. some people will play soccer and basketball, or I now play, you know, Frisbee, ultimate Frisbee. But, but in those days, I was just managing discomfort every day. How, how dig a hole, how deep a hole can I dig for myself, right. you know, and, and hopefully recover from it and improve as a result of it. So it was all about performance for me for the longest time. What's interesting is that like people who've done that for as many years, like you said, you started in the seventies and yeah. like your body doesn't seem like, I don't know, I don't know you on a, in a very deep level, but I just met you, but you don't seem like your body's broken down. Like you look like you're very fit, that like you're still very active. You're doing yeah. ultimate frisbee. How did you even maintain um, that ability given the fact that like, Especially people who are runners like you, yes, yeah. their bodies break down so quick like, after a while. Oh, I, I'm like now on a campaign to eradicate running. Really? Uh, I mean, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but, I want to. But yeah. you know, as I think, walking is the best thing a human being can do for, yeah. for oneself. Um, no, I mean, I, I've lifted weights, uh, so I've maintained muscle mass. I've maintained range of motion. I've, I stretch a little bit. I don't do yoga, um, for better or worse. Um, you know, we'll talk about diet. I mean, I think 80% of my physical, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, results, uh, my body composition as a result of my food choices, which is what I've written about for 30 years. Right. You know, it started with uh, just real food, but then sort of 
morphed into paleo and then primal blueprint and then keto and then intermittent fasting. So I've been at the forefront of a lot of these different modalities or these different ways of eating that manifest themselves in improvements in metabolic flexibility and metabolic efficiency. You talk about that a lot. Yeah. We're going to talk all about the meta metabolic sure. flexibility. Sure. I know that you're like a big advocate for that, obviously. We yeah. were talking about, right? right? I mean, I, I, Rob Wolf and I popularized the term mm. many years ago, and it just okay. became it became this way to describe um, a, a state of the body where you could access um, any substrate for energy that was available at the time or necessary at the time. So, whereas most people spend their lives just being good at burning carbohydrates, right? Mm -hmm. they, they eat a lot of carbs, they turn it into glucose or glycogen, they work out, they burn that, they never burn fat because they never get to the point where the body says, "Let's burn fat." Right. There's always plenty of of calories available in the form of, of glucose or glycogen. So metabolic flexibility describes the ability to extract energy from the fat stored on your body, the fat on your plate of food, the glucose in your bloodstream, the glycogen in your muscles, the carbohydrates that are on your plate of food, the ketones that your liver makes in the absence of glucose. And once you develop the state of flexibility, uh, a whole world of like empowerment opens up where you're not uh, tethered to appetite and cravings and hunger all the time. Your day isn't uh, dic uh, dictated by when meal times are. You have all the energy you want all the time for the most part. Um, and one of the one of the side effects of that is you because you're continually burning off your own stored body fat. Mm -hmm. You tend to have low body fat, which you know a lot of people think is a good thing. Yeah, and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm one, one of them. them. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're both. One yeah. Of them. So so back to you know how how did I get to where I am today, it's a, it's a combination of some, um, initially starting with uh, aerobic athletics, mm -hmm. cardio, they called it uh, in those days, and and uh, and then- They still call it cardio. And transitioned over to uh, uh, weightlifting and speed and strength, which I think was the, probably the right way to do it. And then recently have combined the two of them. So I'll, I was uh, you know telling your husband, I ride a fat bike on the beach, a fat tire bike on the sand in Miami, do that at least uh, once a week, sometimes twice a week. It's a brutal workout, but it's a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. Is it just all the resistance? It's from all the, the resistance oh, from the gosh. deep sand. And, uh, but you know, the good news is you don't even need a helmet because there's no cars. Um, the worst that's going to happen is you fall over because you're going so slow. You can't even yeah. keep the bike upright in the sand. So you fall into soft sand. Uh, I do that. I do stand up paddling. Well, how long do you go on the bike for when you do that? Minimum an hour. And, and, um, actually I'm, I have one in, in LA and I took it down yesterday. I had an hour and a half ride uh, down to Mescal and then down to the beach and it was low tide and I, and I ride um, the low tide line down to Venice Pier and back and then up to Mescal to finish. It was an hour and a half. Wow. It's a great, it's, a, it's amazing. I want to get, I want to get one of those bikes yeah. and do that. Yeah. I, I'm surprised more people don't. It's really one of the coolest workouts I can imagine. The bikes are very stable and sturdy. Yeah. Um, and uh, so between that and stand up paddling, which is my other um, sort of, I would say cardio, except my heart rate never gets above 130 when I'm doing stand up paddling. Right. I can get it to 170 still on the on the fat bike. Do you do e-foiling still? I, I don't like... I I sold my foil. So I it's one of those things where um I'm I'm at a st stage of my life where I'm managing risk better. Yeah. And uh so I I stopped snowboarding 2 years ago. I just don't have the need for speed anymore. Yeah. And I was a I was a avid snowboarder for a long time. Uh one of the best weeks I ever had in my life. I took my 17-year-old son at the time. We went up and did helicopter snowboarding for a week in the, in uh, northern like uh, hella British skiing, Columbia. Yeah, but hella snowboarding. Hella snowboarding. In fact, we went with skiers. You know uh, Wow. You know Tony Horton? Yeah, he lives, of course. He around here. So Tony, Tony I, so Tony's a very good friend. So he and I I'm friends we, with him too. We, yeah, we went <laughs> We went uh, up to uh, Michael Wigley's place. Anyway, so so that's like my idea of adventure, is snowboarding and deep powder. Now that I'm uh, 70 uh, and I'm just relegated to doing, going down groomed slopes in Aspen or you know Mammoth, I'm like I don't I don't need the speed. And if all I'm doing is trying to stay safe and scrub off speed, let me find something else to do. So right. so I did that with so no more snowboarding for me. And then with the foil. Um, it's great, and it's it's an amazing feeling. It's like it's like uh, snowboarding uh, times five in terms of the feeling of floating yeah. and flying. But you know, at some point when you've done it enough times, you just 
you know, doing figure eights around a, a loop around a lake or around an, an, the ocean, it kind of loses its adventure Luster, yeah. na nature for me. And I had I had an accident on it that that sort of made me think, yeah, you know, maybe maybe it's not appropriate for me to keep doing this. So I sold my foil recently. So yeah. what, when was the accident and what kind of accident was uh, it? Just, you know, it was, uh, I, I, I just had a long, for me, a long session, like 45 minutes. And I literally had, hadn't had touched the water once in 45 minutes, which is going back and forth. I thought, tr typical of, of uh, skiers too, one more run. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. make one more run. <laughs> and on that last run, I I did a, a tight turn and I got too high out of the water. And when you're out of the water, you lose the the you you lose the lift and the flight and so it started to, to fall and with with a, a foil like that it's you're riding a guillotine it's a very sharp blade yeah. the wing so i kicked it aside well i kicked it so hard it flipped up and cut me in the back so i you know i just said ah you know that's 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 the universe Tell saying this was fun while it lasted and you know let's what's next you know exactly so, yeah. well i have a couple of them in my in my garage cuz my husband's a big foiler too yeah, yeah. um so okay so let's get back say did you ever do by the way any of those um 100 mile runs or just marathons just Were marathons you, so you didn't do those crazy 100 miles i mean i i probably would have and could have uh, but by the time i retired from running with injuries right. i was i i was unable to do the kind of training yeah. that was necessary to do that. So I would have been good at it because the longer the distance was, the, the more efficient I was. And, you know, I was not a very strong, I was quite strong as a 10K runner, but marathon was a much better distance for me because I could maintain such a high level of my aerobic capacity right. for, wow. for a long period of time. So I think, you know, I think I would have been good at ultras. And now that now with the new, um, you know, equipment that they have, uh, I have a lot of friends, a lot of friends who are wearing my shoes, doing the doing the training in in my shoes for ultras, and then wearing that you know their special trail shoes for but but doing nine hour rucking in the in the mountains over st steep terrain, yeah, wearing the palubas, wearing the toe shoes. So why would they? So why would they be wearing them with the with the training? But the, they're basically like they look like. Five finger shoes. Yeah. By the way, and you weren't behind five finger no. shoes back when I thought you were. No, no. So, because that—that's what I thought. That was your whole movement, primal. This, well, I mean, that. I mean, I was a big fan for the longest time, but it, it, you know, they, in my estimation, they sort of left uh, a lot on the table, a lot, a lot of design uh, potential, and a lot of other things that should have evolved with with that um, technology. Uh, they never got around to. So I said, I said to myself, "Well, I'll, I'll do this myself." So when are they like when did they disappear? They didn't disappear. They're, they're still, still around? around, of course. Yeah. They're oh, still around, yeah. okay. So because yeah. why would people train in these shoes? They're called Paluva guys, yeah. and they're very comfortable. And I will tell you something: um, they actually look cute on, even though they may look a little strange in the box or in a picture. Because Mark's wearing a really nice pair. They're like they're like fake leather, right? So, no, it's real Napa leather. This is they actually, are. This is actual leather. Yeah. Oh, they're because yeah. they're actually cute. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think they're really cute. Yeah. Um, and they are way better for your feet. It's called foot health, which we're going to get all yes, into. Don't yeah, worry. Okay. But you're saying something that like people are training in them, but then why would they actually run in them? Well, at some point we're going to uh, encourage running in these, but it's such a strong, a long oh. transition when you go from. Wearing um, restrictive footwear that's uh, thick and cushiony and encapsulates and encases the feet, and you don't work the small muscles of your feet. Right, atrophies. Right? Uh, if you, the muscles of your feet actually atrophy, and so what happens is you put all that pressure and all the burden on the ankles and the knees and the hips, and that's why people get injured in that's that regard. So true, yeah. I, I have a lot of injuries yes, from that. Yes. I had tons of ankle issues, it's, and my feet became flat because I wear orthotics in my shoes. Right. And when you wear orthotics, you're, you're telling your feet, ah, you don't even need to work yes. your arches out. We'll support your arches for you. You'll, we don't, I don't know, we'll, we'll get into this, but it's, it's, so, so, true, it's so crazy. Though. So my, my uh, ultra runner friends and some of my marathoner friends yeah. are now spending the day in Paluvas doing their errands, walking around, yeah. passively training the small muscles of their feet all day long. They might even, uh, they'll wear them to the gym and they'll do uh, their leg work in them. Uh, they'll do sprints in them. Anything that you would do barefoot, like if you're going to do barefoot yeah. sprints, you do this. But at some point, um, you know, if you haven't trained well enough to get your those small muscles of your feet um, uh, acclimated and adapted, uh, it, you, you know, you can encounter, you can get some, some injuries. Now, there are people, myself included, I could run forever. I think 
I think my Paluvas, the ones that we make for training, are the best running shoes ever made. I've been doing this for 15 years. We just don't encourage it with new, right. new people. So where did the whole idea come from that like you have to wear, like for me, like all oh, my feet are flaps and, and narrow. So then they say, wear these orthotics and do all these things. And then like that, and then over time, those are the things that are probably causing all these crazy injuries. It's, it's bizarre, but that's medicine. That's so p podiatric medicine, podiatry. Yeah. Like I will tell you, like I was in college, I was one of the best, I was the best runner at the captain of the cross country team and, and on the track team. At Williams College, I sat my last year out with it with chondromalacia, with a knee injury, yeah. because I was wearing Nike's thick cushioned uh, trainers, trying to get forty extra miles a week in because I wasn't feeling the pounding. Wow, yeah. Um, and because of those forty extra miles a week, all of the stuff that where it would have been my feet that say, "Hey, hey, you know, slow down, stop. It's yeah. that's enough running for the week." When you bypass all that information, you send it up the chain to the knees or the hips or whatever. Uh, and so in my case, um, I got Connor Malaysia. Well, one of the, one of the cures, I was one of the first miracle cures with orthotics. In 1974, 75, I went back to running and racing because I wore these hard acrylic orthotics. Well, they didn't fix yeah. the problem. They didn't, they, they, they gave, they alleviated the pain. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I still wound up with the problems over time. Yeah. But, you know, um, for, so for a lot of people, if, if you're not fixing, and this is medicine, right? You don't fix the problem, you alleviate the right. symptom. You that's, band that, it. That's modern medicine. So, yeah, exactly. so if you have a, uh, you know, if you're a podiatrist and, and you believe in orthotics, one of your, you, you're gonna want that, uh, that approval from your patient. Oh my God, my pain went away because of the orthotics. Thank you, doc. Well, went away for now, but it's just moving around to other parts of the body. And yeah. I'm not gonna say that some people don't need orthotics, but there's, your feet are born perfect. Some people, oh, I was born with flat feet. Jennifer, I don't know yeah. what I'm going to do. I've got flat feet. How am I? I was born that way. You are born with perfect feet. You just, the fact that you don't have a pronounced arch doesn't mean that all of the, the musculature in your foot, including the plantar fascia, doesn't work. It's just you haven't used it. Right. You've been encasing it your whole life. You're pissed, you know. It's your parents' fault. They put you in these cute little, <laughs> cute little shoes. They look so cute, you know, the little Mary they Janes did and all look the. Really cute, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then you get to high school and you start wearing heels and you start looking. Go, oh, that looks really cute. And right. then the next thing you know, you've got foot problems. No, one hundred percent. And it's over. It's overuse over time. Okay, we'll get back to that afterwards. I want to get back to why you look so good. Okay, so the running, then you went the stair. You did the uh, strength training, but now. What else are you doing to maintain this? So you, you told me what you do in terms of exercise. Yeah, so I lift twice a week. I mean, I do. I want the non-negotiables. Like, what do you do every morning? I want to know your routine. Usually I wait till the end for this part, yeah, but yeah. I, I saw you. I'm like, I got to ask. Like, this, this is the information people want to know, right? Because yeah. look at you. I mean, he literally is like, you would think he was 35. Okay, go oh, on. Thank you. I gosh. Yeah, it's um, true. I uh, appreciate that because I've spent a lot of time in the sun and my, I think my, you know, the, the, the face does not, does not lie about that. But Tell me about it. anyway, um, not. And I don't feel hungry. Why would I want to eat? You know, so I, I have a cup of coffee when I wake up. I do. Do you put milk in the coffee or cream? You, heavy cream. Heavy cream. Yeah. Okay. So I know you're also in the ketogenic stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. but wait, can I ask you a question? Before I even go into this, I think this is an important thing to, to ask. Are you someone who lives to eat or eats to live? Because if someone who lives to eat, like yeah. I love food, yeah. it's really hard for me to intermittent fast and to do yeah. all these things, right? Because I love food so much, right? People who don't, there are other people who don't give a shit. Like they can eat, they forget to eat. I'm not one of those people. Yeah. So it's easier for them. For are you one of those people? Yeah. No, I'm. I'm someone who I don't live to eat. Um, I eat to live. Right. But that but sense. that doesn't mean I don't enjoy every single bite of food I put in my mouth. So I don't eat stuff. Okay. Just because it's supposed to be good for me, for instance, if if mm. it, if it doesn't taste good, like you could make me the best kale salad you ever made with a lemon you know, vinegar, whatever, dressing. I'm like, thanks, but no thanks, not having it, you know. Mm -hmm. I I eat what I want to eat and typically when I want to eat it. And then I think one of the great skills is to is to realize when it's time to finish. And right. you can push the plate away and say, you know what? I don't need to finish that 12-ounce steak. I don't need to, you know, finish uh, 
all of the salad that was put in front of me, even though it might be, you know, considered ultra healthy. Right. Um, so you limit the amount of intake, food intake. I don't, and I, I don't do it out of uh, some sense of uh, um, <laughs> anorexia, you know, or, yeah, and whatever. Orthorexia. You know, or yeah, anore- orthorexia. Yeah. yeah. I just do it because I, I, I'm so in tune with when I'm no longer hungry for the next bite. And it's, you know, so many people, you're, you're a great example of what I would say most people who look at life and who really appreciate food and who would say, um, what's the most amount of this meal I can eat and not gain weight? Mm-hmm. Right? That's what's what the most amount of this dessert I can have and not feel like Or a I pick food that has big volumes. Sure. Yeah. Or what's, you know, how can I really fill myself up here and not feel like a pig or not feel like I'm overdoing it right. and feel good about myself? How and, can I gorge? And, 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 and no, no, no. And how can, yeah. I, and how can I gorge? Oh, and then over a lifetime, how can I eat? A lot and not gain too much weight. Yeah. Um, and so you see people who are, I've seen over the years, decades, see people at the gym and they're on the treadmill like five days a week, burning 450, 500 calories on the treadmill. I'm like, what? Like, first of all, it's beautiful outside and you could go run outside. Why are you in the gym burning, you know, on this treadmill? Well, I like to see how many calories I burn on the treadmill. Oh, why do you do that? Well, I love to eat. Yeah. So, so wait a minute, you're kidding me. So you would rather put yourself through all this struggle and suffering and sweating and misery so you can have a few more bites of something you probably shouldn't have in the first place? Like how how bizarre is that as a as a motivation? So true, for... but haven't you ever heard of the saying common sense isn't so common? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I took I took a an opposite approach a bunch of years ago and I said instead of seeing what what's the most amount of food I can eat, um, and not gain weight. What about what's the least amount of food I can eat? Uh, maintain muscle mass or build muscle mass. Mm-hmm. Have all the energy I want. Never get sick, and most importantly, not be hungry. Because the hunger part of it yeah. destroys everything. And and if you do that experiment and you start to really pay attention to how much food you used to eat and how much you don't need to eat, right? And if you and if you break it down, it's like nobody needs more than 120 grams of protein a day. You really don't. Yeah. You don't need more than 150 grams of carbs. And even if you did, it would mostly be in the form of vegetables. And if the rest is fat, we're, we're talking about less than 2,000 calories a day. So most people could live on and – and I could live um, well and maintain my, my, you know, my mass and my energy on 1,750 calories a day and working out uh, for an hour a day. I, I can get away with more, and I do, and I eat more, but I eat cyclically, so some days I don't eat that much. Some days I eat not twice as much, but I eat, I eat right, more. Right, 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 right. But you're not eating for emotional. But I'm not, I'm not and, and, and again, I'm, I'm back to this notion that if you, if you appreciate when, first of all, if you understand that you, that you don't need to eat that much to maintain all this stuff. So you don't need to. That's not a requirement. Um, and so what, what it becomes is a luxury, like, okay, how much can I eat and not gain weight? And how much can I eat? And so most people find out that, that the 3,500 calories a day that they're consuming, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, um, they, they would be well served at 2,200 calories, you know, 30% less than they're consuming if they were just a little bit more judicious about their choices, mm-hmm. which also means um, more nutritious food. So when you're judicious about your food choices and you're not eating the bag of Doritos or the Ding Dongs, the right. Ho Hos, or the or the, or the yeah. whatever, um, and you eat you know f- food that is that is uh, nutrient dense, as they say now, um, you wind up not being that hungry anyway. Well, yes, but also there's a difference between need and want. Like I know I don't need to eat that much, but yeah. I want to because also. I think the pro- what you're what you were saying also the treadmill situation that let's just use that whole conundrum because the more you work out the hungrier you get too. Yeah. So then that's it becomes, an issue. Right. That's an issue. It's an issue. So what I've had to do, and this is like a trick I guess that I've you know if I work if I like run super hard like I do like hard sprints yeah I end up eating way more during the day because I'm starving versus if I went like kind of slow and more moderate I won't eat as much so it actually makes more sense for my body yeah. to go slower so I won't have that ra- that, that appetite that's like ravenous Does I get it? it I get it but you know again we talk about genetics um, yeah you know as um, uh, Blake Shelton would say, "You're so little." Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. So you you have the genetics that allows you to get away Mm-mm. with that, and you say, Mm-mm, "But you do." I mean, it's like 
you know how it can manifest itself in some people it's 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 pretty um impressive how quickly people can gain weight yeah. with just a little bit of extra food daily over yeah. you know over time over time so um so maybe now we're talking about uh, some mental adjustment to your emotional attachment to food and what does it mean that you have to feel like you have to finish what's on your plate or I you know. or you look at a size of you you look at uh the buffet which has 12 slices of cheesecake and you pick the biggest one because it's still one serving. A hundred percent. This is like a therapy <laughs> session now. You're a hundred percent right. That's exactly what I yeah, do. Yeah. But it's so true. It's all, a lot of it's behavioral and also psychological. What about your supplements? Like, are you taking, are you on, I want to add, are you, a, you know, I've heard you also talk that you're not into all the biohacking nonsense, yeah, right? Yeah. So does that mean you're not a, like, are you, are you doing the sauna? Are you doing the cold plunge? What are you doing in terms of right. modalities? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in terms of supplements, I I do take testosterone, and I've been doing testosterone, okay. uh, you know, DR, TRT yep. for uh, almost 10 years. Just a, a, a minimum. Oh, interesting. Only for uh, 10 years. So when oh, you're yeah, 60. Yeah. I started when I was 60, yeah. A little after 60, yeah. So it's like, you know, that's become a huge craze now. Like, yeah. people in their 40s, yeah. my like, people in the, even their 30s are yeah. taking it. yeah. Um, but you said you didn't start until you were no, 60. No, no, no. I didn't start until I felt I, – I, like I, I held off as long as I could okay. until I thought, all right, now I'm at a point where if I don't do this, my muscle mass will decline uh, at, at a rate that I can't keep up with. Um, and, and it had more to do with my, the practical application of my being able to go play ultimate Frisbee or yeah. ride you know, with, with the guys. Uh, and to be competitive s still in that regard. So did you see like your ability kind of um, getting less and less and that's why you decided at 60? Yeah, I mean, I just, I saw my muscle mass go, my weight dropping a pound a year or something like right. that. And I knew it was all muscle because, uh, you know, I'd, um, I've, I've had the same body fat since I was 19. Uh, wow. You know. So you knew, so that's why you yeah. went on. To, so you started that and then what did you see happen? Did you like become like, because now you look very muscular again. No, I'm, Did it make I'm, a big difference in your life? Five pounds. It, it, so, so over the course of a year, I put on, I put on five or six pounds. I worked hard at it, and then I just now I've maintained that for almost ten years. So you've been doing that for ten years, yep. and you do you do a shot yourself every yep. day, I guess. No, no, no. no. Once, once a week, a week. just once a week. Yeah. Once a week. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I do, um, uh, I do collagen because I'm a big fan of collagen. I make a collagen supplement. The reason I make a collagen supplement yeah. was because I'm such a big fan of it, and I think everybody ought to supplement with collagen. Is it the one that you just – wait, Primal Kitchen? Yeah. But you sold that, like yes. five, you said, four years ago. Yeah. So – but you're still – so even though you exited, still do you have, do you have another line of supplements that you just No, started? no, no. I, primal Kitchen makes collagen supplements. Oh, you're st so you're still yeah, taking yeah. that Primal Kitchen that you create. Why would I not? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, no, because you know a lot of times what happens is people get bought out by big companies, and yeah. they change the formulation. No, 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 no. So, I mean, this is – I get this all the time. Like, oh, you sold out to Kraft Heinz. You sold <laughs> out the big food i would do the same thing and most people would honey and and i'm like uh well you, you, big food um god bless them they're 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 obligated to um improve their shareholder equity in our case um Kraft Heinz is a company that owns 50 different brands. And their brands are legacy brands, you know, Jell-O, Kool-Aid, Crystal Light, Oscar Mayer, Orida, Planters Peanuts. They've owned all these not these brands, Jell-O. They have no the brands have brands. no relationship to each other. They're just a collection of great yeah. or, or not so great companies. Uh, and so they saw what we were doing and they said, that's a company we'd like to acquire and, that, and we'd like to uh, expand it and grow it. Because some of the other legacy companies are contracting over time. You know, not that many people are, are consuming Jell-O anymore. And so they, were, so they bought us, not because they wanted to change us, but they're like, oh my God, these guys... Yeah, know what they're doing, and they're changing food. We've already spawned, I don't know, 50 other uh, companies that are in the same space that we're in right now that are using better-for-you ingredients the way we are. So my mission there was to change the way the world eats, and we've done that. You have. Well, yeah. wait, so wait, when you sold it four years ago, yeah. right, um, how, big were, how big was the company before you sold it? Like how many employees? What was the revenue? Like what was all that? Um, okay, so um, I forget. I don't know if I can even say this, but we were like you, you know can forty it. yeah forty seven million in revenue, something like that. Okay, sold it for two hundred million, and uh, wound up and we had hundred employees at the time. All the employees are still with the company. It's really? still, oh yes, it's all it's still the company's still based in Oxnard, where we where we had our original uh, plant and and uh, warehouse. Um, 
you know, it's it's grown exponentially since then. We're in, I don't know, 60,000 stores around the country of 85 SKUs. So I would not have been able to do that myself. Uh, there's a point at which a founder has to go, you know, how, how willing am I to um, personally guarantee every freaking loan against this company, yep. securing my house and the mortgage of my house and, and, and my 401k against, you know, against the potential loss. Uh, and we had some unique situations where I was at the time probably the largest buyer of avocado oil in the world. So I had to be buying avocado oil a year in advance around the world to be able to make the products that we make. Uh, so it was, it was wow. unique in that regard. So when when Kraft acquired us, it, they were like, and we had other suitors, but Kraft was like, I see what these guys want to do. I see how they the resources they offer, whether it's distribution, whether it was uh, you know warehousing certainly funding i mean they you know they've they've funded us the marketing budget went way up quickly i would never have been able to do that no way yeah so what was their marketing budget what, where, what was the marketing budget I'm, i i'm not i can't i mean i guess you could look it up i could look they, it up. they went to like 20 million or 25 million a year it's you know in marketing budget so, and how much was it before they oh, even bought it three two three i mean i you know it was like I, I'm, I'm like writing every check before that. So, I know. Wow. Yeah, I, I had no investors in in Primal Kitchen, so I was the, you know, I was the sole source of financing, until about a year or eighteen months before we sold. I, 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 I allowed some of my close friends to acquire a small piece in exchange for cash, that I literally kept in the bank and didn't touch. But but when I went to increase my line of credit, yeah, the cash was there. You wow, know, yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. So um, So you didn't have any investor. How did you how were you able cuz you said to me when we before we started, you said you were always very entrepreneurial, yeah, right? Yeah. How did you like what what was because you can't make money being an endurance no. you know runner. No. So where did you get the capital even to start Primal Kitchen? What were you doing prior? Were you a, were you a successful entrepreneur already? I know the Daily Apple. I mean, yeah, yeah, that, was a, that was a very popular No, no, no. I started a supplement company in um called uh Primal Nutrition in 1997. Okay. And, uh, okay. Yeah. So I, and I, and, and it, it grew relatively quickly over a bunch of years, but I was very, very close. Like I had nine, I had seven employees and was doing like $9 million a year and, and taking home 3 million from that company. So that was like really, you know, wow. cl close in kind of stuff. And, and this was before the internet. This is before people are doing, 150 million in sales, but they're spending 175 million exactly. in, in, in advertising. So that's what I want people to understand yeah. for people who don't know, because yeah. uh, this is like Mark has been like, you've been very, before internet, social media, and all that other nonsense, you were like, to me, I remember like your rise, because mm -hmm. I was like, I was like watching, because I was, I was like, oh my God, look at this guy, the, the letter. And he's like, right, you're always like doing all these walks in your bare feet, and you're doing, I remember the primal yeah. nutrition. And like you were like the poster child of like fitness and health naturally. It, yeah. When I say naturally, like out in the out in the world doing it, right? Yeah. Like, and you know, I always was wondering, like, did he come from money? Did you? How did you start? Yeah, was it so, just <clears throat> I I grew up. I mean, this is a classic story. I grew up yeah. in a poor in a poor fishing village in Maine, right? And in, in a little fishing village in Maine, and um, we were poor, but we didn't know it kind of, yeah. you know, that, that, that whole story. So I started uh, at the age of 12, I was working 40 hours a week in the summers mowing lawns. Uh, and then I started painting houses at the age of 14. I put myself through, uh, prep school and college, uh, painting houses. And then that was going to be pre-med, but I was making enough money that, that, um, and I was, uh, training for the Olympics at the time. So I put off going to med school for, uh, for a couple of years, which is now, <laughs> 50 years uh yeah. best thing i ever did yeah. was not go to med school um and then you know and i had different i had a frozen yogurt shop in 1981 82 which was the first early days of frozen yogurt um had a publishing company uh in the 70s and 80s started writing books um long before the books that you're familiar with i had written a couple of self self-published a couple of books um so I was, and anyway, I started, I started a supplement company in 1997 called Primal Nutrition, and I grew it on my uh, appearances on television, not home shopping or QVC, but I would be on these little cobbled together cable 
like faith and family networks. Um, like where, media uh, buying? Were you buying no, time? No, I was just I was I was buying time, but from one show. This guy, Doug Kaufman, to this day, we're great friends. He had a show called Know the Cause, and I would sponsor uh, his show. He would buy time on um, on a uh, Christian broadcasting channel called Family Net. And then I would buy time on his show, and we just talk about uh, before podcasts. We talk the same way we're talking now. And oh, by the way, I have these great supplements. And 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 if you're interested, call this number. Operators are standing by because that's the only way you could buy in those yeah. days. Oh, wow. And so it grew nicely for a, for a number of years. And then 2004, um, internet started becoming a thing. Um, Dish and Direct yeah. launched with 300 channels. So in the old days, it was ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, PBS. And it was always on a Saturday, you could see one infomercial. And they were pretty interesting. You could watch an infomercial. And you totally. Could see. Well, now all of a sudden with 300 channels, there was infomercials everywhere. And so the the call of infomercial world dropped down. And 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 in the old days, you used to be able to buy like for $1,000 of local time on KTLA or something like that here. Um, you could do five thousand dollars in business. It was it was great, but over the years it got less and less. And then eventually a thousand dollars worth of ad spend got you maybe two hundred dollars of actual revenue, and so you had to make it up with right. upsells and you know a continuity or you know auto ship. So in two thousand four, that whole model that I'd been counting on dried up, and um, so I d I took one year two thousand five, and I produced my own TV show. It's called Responsible Health. I shot fifty one half hour episodes of a health show on a on a set with guests. Um, it was a great show, and uh, I thought I was going to like self liquidate. In other words, I was going to be my own sponsor, and and uh, I bought time on uh, Travel Channel. I was on every morning at eight thirty on Travel Channel, but it it. Did not it failed to materialize? It, it I lost I don't know a million and a half dollars doing that, a million and a half bucks that I did not have. By the way, wow! So how did you even? Yeah, what did you do? So in two thousand six, I said, I'm good at cr the content part of this. I'm going to start a blog. Like this new blog thing sounds yeah. kind of cool, and you know I thought I'll start blogging and within a year I'll have a hundred thousand followers. This will be amazing, you know. And well, within a year I had like you know a thousand followers a day or something, a thousand views a day, and. But over the years, it became, within five or six years, it became the most popular ancestral blog on the internet. And we w rose up through the ranks. I don't know if you remember Alexa, which was the original uh, yeah, ranking system. We got up to 3,200 on Alexa. I don't know if you know, if you, if you remember Alexa, it ranked it, from, on, on one, every, on from one to 350 million. I remember. And we, we were 3,200, 30 yeah. And the wow. first 50 were like, you know, Google Russia, Google France, Google India, blah, blah, blah. So, so whatever happened to Alexa? Is it gone now? I think it's gone. I haven't heard about it for a long time. Except Alexa, like the Alexa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know, the weather. So, <laughs> yeah. So you mean so you just start? So you're like an early adopter of yes. this idea. Yeah. So, so then, like, by the way, how many people now are do you have like? Subscribed? So I, you know, we I think we hit our our max at probably three and a half million a month, uniques a month. Yeah. At one point, um, but but then what happened was. Mark's Daily Apple spawned thousands of other similar websites. And so the attention span of the average viewer who used to only go to Joe Mercola, Mark yeah. Sisson, and, and whatever, uh, Mark's Daily Apple, now had all these other choices. So we, we sort of de declined in that area. But based on that um, platform that I built, yeah. I was able to have a best-selling uh, best book my the primal blueprint went to went to number one on Amazon, of all books worldwide. One day on Amazon, um, on the, on a on a push that I that I that I Did gave on that out there. That's, yeah. By the way, because everything now is so you don't have a newsletter yeah. that you can't. It's hard to sell and yeah. and create a community. So you have you had a built in community to sell right. whatever the hell you wanted. So that primal nutrition, those supplements, you had a direct vessel. It's Correct. selling so much. And what happened was because I was writing so much about food and doing things naturally and not taking supplements. Yeah. My supplement business sort of fell by the wayside, and so in 2014. I thought to myself, I'm, I'm writing about food. I'm writing about you know how food is the way to um, to change your health. Um, every Friday we have a um, a recipe. Uh, 
often it's for a sauce or a dressing or something like that. People who recognize that once they give up the pies, the cakes, the candies, the cookies, the sweetened beverages, the, the pastas, the whatever, it's a pretty small grouping of food that's left. And the only thing you can do about it is put cool stuff on it, sauces, dressings, toppings, herbs, spices, the methods of preparation. Uh, and I realized that there was nothing in the regular grocery aisle that would uh, fit my criteria for a better for you, good for you, healthy mayonnaise or, or salad dressing, even Newman's own. So that's how Primal Kitchen got started. So wait, you only started Primal Kitchen in what year? 2014. 2014. Yeah. And you, you only sold it like in 2019, 18? Yeah. So you only had it for five years? I had it for less than that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we started in 2014. We didn't, we didn't launch our first product until oh uh, February of 2015. And by the end of 2018, I had a firm offer to, to buy. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was one of the fastest growing food companies. And what would the, have happened if you if you held on to it for two more years? Well, two more years we we had COVID. Well, yeah, the COVID. We yeah, had. I mean, so you know, we we have. The there are a lot of t timing things yeah. where I'm like, what would have happened is you know I probably would have, um, you know, I don't know what I would have done. It was a it was a stressful time for me. So it 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 worked out. Just, the, the just way, fine, th thank you. So that's hold on. So the so the stop. Just to like finish the loop on the supplement company. Did you just shut it down? The primal no. Nutrition? So 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 Kraft bought the supplement company along so, with. So you still had the so okay, the, so, they, they're still Primal Kitchen supplements. They they got sort of rebranded from Primal Nutrition to Primal Kitchen. But you were selling the Primal Nutrition supplement at the same time as from, food from nineteen ninety seven. Yeah. So here's way? so here's to to close that loop on financing a business. Yeah. So I had this supplement company that, that was generating a good income for yeah. me. And I said, I'm going to start a, a food company, but I'm not going to start a separate food company because that would mean I'd take for every dollar I make in California and take out of the company, I have to, I, I'm, I literally wind up with 40 cents right. that I can put over here to start a new company. So I started adding products to the old company. Yeah. So, um, so Primal Kitchen never existed as a company. It it was owned by Primal Nutrition, right. LLC. And the brand became Primal Kitchen. And so we wound up doing business as Primal Kitchen. But the company, uh, so, so I was using pre-tax dollars to do the R&D, to, to hire the new people, to, to, um, to test the, the concept, and ultimately to grow the company. Oh my gosh! So, what was your first product you came out with for Primal uh, the Kitchen? The mayonnaise, what we call the OG mayonnaise. The, 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 the mayonnaise was the yeah, first, not yeah, the yeah. ketchup. No, God, the ketchup was way late. The ketchup was years later. The the, the original product was uh, Primal Kitchen regular mayonnaise, avocado oil based mayonnaise, yeah. and then we had a chipotle lime. We had uh, a, a garlic aioli mayonnaise. So we had three mayonnaises within a year. Um, we were we broke every rule. I mean, s some of our um, our mentors would say, you can't be in more than one aisle. Well, at the end of six months, we had two flavors of mayonnaise, two bars in the bar aisle, uh, collagen bars. Right, I remember and, that. And then three um, salad dressings in the, in the dressing aisle, you know. And we were crushing it. We were just like... Rushing it. Yeah. yeah. I can't even believe that. So basically, not until recently, you, you, you weren't really this rich until recently. Yeah, correct. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. I, I really didn't. I really thought that like it was more. I didn't realize that you. It's a <laughs> hobby of yeah, mine. Yeah, and I was yeah, like, this like <laughs> rich kid floating around, just you well, know, you so working like, out all day, you look going so to the debonair, yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks. And you're Thank like you. doing all these fun things. They're like, yeah. I heard you're like saying Bart's here, saying doing this yeah, yeah, and doing yeah. that. Like, yeah. so this is like a new lifestyle for you, in a way. Um, yeah. I mean, look, I, uh, I lived. We lived well. Uh, my wife and I. Yeah. Um, and you've been married for like 100 years, too, Yeah, right? close. Yeah. Uh, we've been together 35. Oh. I just had my 70th birthday in, in France, and, and it was the uh, 35th. Aunt. She kissed The first time she kissed me was on my birthday when I was 35 years old. So she's been with me more than half my life. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, but we've, you know, we've taken nice vacations. We've lived in nice homes. We've driven nice cars. Um, you know, we, we nice restaurants. We've we've had a, yeah, a yeah, nice. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, I was I was making between two and three million a year with my little supplement business. And as we say in Malibu, some people can live on that. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> so exactly. Uh, I mean, it's, so hor- it's, it's horrible to say, but no, it's you know, so true. It's like, come yeah, on, it's like yeah. it's hilarious. It's like it's it's different here. It's yeah, just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, in other aspects of my life, I've always been very a very minimalist guy. Like my that's your whole brand. My of course. you know my. Uh, you know, my daily uniform is uh, some Lululemon shorts and a T-shirt. You Tell know, me about and, it. And uh, some Paluvas now. And yeah, exactly. Uh, on these trips. That's amazing. C- congratulations. Yeah. That's like, Thanks. that's really amazing. So then because of the newsletter, are you able to pu- like push through the Paluvas? Like basically anything that you. It's been around for 10 years. Uh, we've trained 5,000 coaches. It's completely an online learning experience. Oh, okay. It's the most robust health coaching program in the world. And I've had many doctors take it and say, disease and illness and d- working with the patients to fix it, not to put a Band-Aid on it. So anyway, I have this, I have the Primal Health Coach Institute. Okay. And how many people do you have that you've, you've we, we put 5,000 people. So what that. are the prerequisites? Can any, you know, Tom, Dick, or Harry just start to do it? Pre- pretty much. Although it helps to have a basic college education. You okay. don't need to. We've had a couple of people with a, a basic high school education go through, but you need a college education, but you're going to learn, uh, you know, biology and you're going to learn biomechanics and you're going to learn, learn, and, uh, I mean, in addition to all the science and all mm-hmm. the stuff, my, my idea was, because my original plan was I wanted to change the lives of 10 million people around the world. That was my original mission at Mark's Daily Apple. And then a couple of years in, I, I added a zero to it. So I wanted it to be 100 million people. Um, certainly, my books have had some effect on that. Um, podcasts, obviously. Um, the blog itself. The you food- have a podcast too, right? No. I mean, we do. It's a primal, ki- it's a primal, primal kitchen, one. kitchen podcast, but my uh, co-founder Morgan uh, at Primal Kitchen, who's still now, she's a CEO of Primal Kitchen and she's, you know, she's a dynamo who runs Primal Kitchen for craft. So she's, Oh, yeah. so you had a co-founder? Yeah. Oh, okay. What was her role in the beginning of this whole thing? So uh, her, her role was initially, uh, she was, uh, a marketing director at a sparkling probiotic company called Kavita. Oh, I and remember that's, them. That's where, that's where I met her. And they, Kavita sponsored an event that we had yeah. that I, my company had, we used to hold these, uh, events called Primal Con. We do a three day experience at a resort and we'd, for three days, people would come in from around the world and they'd learn how to Olympic lift and how to sprint right and how to move right and how to do throw an addle addle. I mean, it was crazy. It was, and, and we had guest speakers who would come in. And so all the original early guest speakers, you know, Rob Wolf and uh, John Durant and, you know, people that, that you now uh, have probably listened, have listened to for a long time. Uh, doctors would talk. Um, it's and no it, longer, you guys, you, you don't do it anymore? No, anymore? we did about 15 of them over the years. Oh, okay. And we usually have anywhere from hundred to 150 people. Oh, wow. For three days. It was, okay. it was great. But anyway, so Morgan, on behalf of Kavita, they sponsored an event, and Kavita was located in Oxnard, and we were having an event at the um, Embassy Suites on the beach in Oxnard. So okay. we just, uh, so she wanted to meet me. She was a fan. So she wanted, so she brought the product over, and, and we wound up hanging out for dinner that night. And then she drove my wife and myself home and said, Oh, by the way, here's my card. I'm thinking about leaving Kavita if you ever need any help in marketing. So literally, like six months later, I just decided to do this this food company, and I called her up and I said, "You know, what are you what are you up to?" So for a year, she worked for me uh, as a you know as a consultant, as a marketing consultant, hourly. Um, long long story short, I had had earlier partners that just didn't work out, and I bought them out. And so I I, I said to Morgan, "Let's let's just do this. You know, let's we're waiting too long to get stuff to market. Let's just make this happen." And so she came on, and she she got awarded some equity. So I. You know, she was a co-founder 
in that regard. Right. Yeah. So basically, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Wow. And so that's the girl who does the Primal Kitchen podcast. Podcast, basically. yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. And then, okay, by the way, I think we didn't talk about you, you were talking about sup we got like totally I know, we're all over the place, yeah. I know because it's so fascinating yeah. to me. But what supplements are you said collagen is the supplement that you believe yeah, in yeah. a lot. Yep. you you take the primal kitchen one. Yep. Or primal nutrition. I, primal nutrition, yeah. Okay, what other ones are you a um, believer in? I, vitamin D. Vitamin D, okay. Yeah. yeah, everyone, and I feel like everyone like me, everyone takes this vitamin D. Yeah. It's become very common. Yeah. What other ones? That's effective dose of food what's the minimum effective dose of exercise that i can do yeah get away with and not beat myself up but still benefit from and i think if you times. get rid of grains grains are such absolute leechers of everything in your body like the original rdas which were created in the 40s, I think they were based on a grain-based diet. So yeah, you had to have you know all of these high levels of right. vitamins and minerals to keep up because the, the grain was <laughs> sucking it all out of you. Right. When you get rid of grains, uh, for the most part, and you cut back on uh, sugar and you get rid of seed oils, and you just have these nutrient-dense foods that are, in my case, meat-based, animal protein-based, you don't, th there's all the nutrients that you need in those. And I remember getting in. Vitamin C to 25 grams a day. I mean, that that's just unbelievable. You know, like the, the RDA is 60 milligrams. I was doing... Whatever that is, yeah. you know, a five hundred times. Yeah, five hundred times of at least. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I got, I would get, I got sick from doing that. Cure it. I mean, you hear a lot of people talk about like um, electrolytes now, and so yeah. magnesium is a big thing. But if you don't balance out the magnesium with potassium and sodium and then, then you have other issues. Well, that's the problem, right? Because everything now, especially with social media, people are so confused. Yeah. And so they hear one person say one thing, another person say another thing, and then they end up taking everything and not knowing what they're even deficient right. in. Right, right. As opposed to like, but then how do you know, how did you figure out what is the minimum amount of this, minimum amount of that that I can do, get, that I can get away with to be right. as efficient as possible? How do you even figure that out? Yeah, so the two things that I look at are, first of all, in the terms of collagen, collagen should be a fourth macronutrient. Yeah. There should be protein, fat, carbohydrate, and collagen. And collagen is different from protein because it's different. There are different configurations of diet. You have to either eat the gristle, uh, the skin, uh, bone broth, right. uh, chicken stock. Uh, and since we don't do that regularly anymore, I mean, we did a generation ago or two generations ago, but we don't now. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole generation in the 80s of people, bodybuilders, who ate skinless, boneless chicken breast yeah. and white rice. Do you remember Jesus. that? Oh my God. Do I, that, that, I remember yeah. it? I that like, was like whatever. By the way, people still do that. You know that. I know. I know. Uh, so collagen, I think, is important as a, and you need to get like 10, 20, 30 grams a day in, in my estimation, because it's the only thing that really supports connective tissue. And so much of your body is collagen. It's the most prevalent actual protein in your body between fascia, ligaments, tendons, uh, cartilage. Uh, so what do you do then? You just, you supplement? You want to come over to my house and make some bone broth yeah. and do some chicken stock and <laughs> sure. stand over that stove 100%. and simmer, simmer all day. In my spare time, I'll be yeah, more yeah, than exactly. happy to do it. Right. Um, so you do that. How many? So I, uh, you take how many spoonfuls of that? Uh, Twenty grams a day usually. Because they say that doesn't like. Uh, the 
because I had I had my own experience of coming back from a from a debilitating injury that I thought was going to end my a bit, my running jumping was this career. Was the Achilles? The Achilles thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I came back from that like a hundred percent. So I'm like, okay, I get that. Then I've seen a couple of studies where they label. Uh, session, and then yeah. they label the uptake into the Achilles after the. It's pretty cool, really. And you can show the increased uptake of the of the collagen peptides. Yeah, I should try this to is a more term. of that. So yeah. That's something you really believe in highly. I do. Okay, what else then? And then vitamin D. And vitamin D, as I've said for twenty years, shouldn't be considered a vitamin. It's more like a hormone. It's a, it, yeah, it, it's a prohormone. So because it regulates your hormones. Right. So I'm still not supplementing with it with with one particular vitamin because vitamin D should be should be a hormone. So that's it. And um, you know, that's uh, so far, you know, so good that I've cut back in the last maybe five or 10 years to wow. just that. Yeah. How about peptides? Are you a big believer in peptides? Do you do the sauna? Do you do the cold plunge? Do you do all so, those yeah, things? Yeah, so I don't do peptides. Um, my wife loves them, so Carrie does. Mm. And she she believes in them, and I can't <laughs> argue with the results. Um, but I just, I've tried a couple times and didn't see anything, and, and it just didn't, did didn't, didn't work for me. Um, I was an early adopter of the cold plunge. Okay. Um, started doing it probably 15 years ago uh, at our house in Malibu, and and this was this was completely unrelated to the latest science. But I was uh, as a as a triathlete, um, I was probably the best runner that ever crossed over into triathlon. I became a very good cyclist, and I was a shit swimmer. Yeah. Like I have a record at Ironman that'll never be broken, and that's the slowest swim time for a top five finisher. Um, had I learned how to swim, yeah. my life would have changed because I would have been probably one of the best in the world, and it would have shifted every th all my choices. So glad that didn't happen. Wow. But over the years, I'm like... So at one point in in Malibu, I'm like, this is this is ridiculous. Like I like I squ I squeal getting into you know an 81 degree public pool. What the hell's that about? So <laughs> yeah. So I said I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with that. So I I uh, we kept our pool unheated. Thirty mile an hour, forty mile an hour cold winds blow it off, yeah. and so it super cools. So we would have this ritual every night where I'd go out the backyard naked, walk into the pool with zero affect, just thinking to myself, "It's not good. It's not bad. It's just a sense." We did that for years. Then when we moved to, to Miami, we, uh, we have a, a spa there with a cold plunge. But I think what I found for myself is that I, I never really got the, the, the so-called, the purported benefits of you know, brown fat activation or uh, uh, decreased inflammation. It was just a head trip for me. It's yeah. just, it's all, all it's ever been is like, okay, I'm going to go do a cold plunge. I know I'll feel good. I'll feel refreshed after I do it. Right. I mean, it was, it was great. But I wasn't doing it for some long range longevity strategy or for, for reducing inflammation. Right. It was more like do something every day that makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. And I stopped running a long time ago and I stopped, you know, whatever. So, so this for me was my, um, my, my discomfort. What, what I found happening was that it became, um, it, that, then it just, so many people started doing it and I, I, encouraged other people to do it at my at my building that I live in in the gym and the spa and then you know they'd say how long did you spend in the cold plunge today I'm like well I did four and a half minutes well I did five and a half today Mark I'm like oh shit now I gotta go to seven just to show you can be done <laughs> and it became this ridiculous and then I got sick a couple of times spending too much in the time in the cold plunge really oh of course and a, a, a hormetic stress is only good to the point that it's gonna cause a positive adaptation 100%. but they be but hormetic stress has become bad um quite rapidly it's a it's a it's a curve and at the other end of the curve it might cost you a couple of days in recovery whether I, it's yeah. whether it's too much time in the sauna whether it's too much time in the cold plunge whether it's uh too long a run on a hot day 
or you know, like if you were an, like I was an as an athlete, I know I left some of my best races on the track two weeks before the race, thinking I gotta you know I gotta dial this in, I gotta I gotta do one more right. half mile at you know two fourteen. So uh, it was it, I've I've also recognized that in this risk management stage that I'm in of my life, yeah yeah yeah, that um, there's some, some there are some things I just don't need to do and and. Great. Do a couple of minutes. I don't. I don't need to break a record. Right. You know, it sounds to me you're very, um, like you're like a very practical person. You're not very. I mean, you're extreme. You maybe you were extreme with your exercise, yeah. but like everything else seems like you have. Long, I used to believe no, I get everyone sends me all their wearables. I wear them for a couple months and I'm like, what am I doing? Like yeah, yeah. they don't even like, what's the point? Like I need someone to tell me if I'm sleeping well, not sleeping well. Like I know if I slept well or not. Right. Well, and and uh, well, as, as I. Hour and a half. And we play man on man, and uh, so you know I'm I'm being very economical with my running. I don't I don't make an end zone run, uh, you know every every play. If I'm guarding my man, I'm I'm keeping him within a distance. And at the end of the game, my the guy the guy I was guarding, he asked everybody around, "Did you start your watch today?" And everybody started their watches. <laughs> well, mine says I burned thirteen hundred and twenty calories. I'm like. Jesus, man! I, like, if you burn three hundred and twenty calories, I would be surprised. Even that's a lot. By Your the way. watch is lying to you. Well, you know, it's said it every week, and okay, well, you're still fat. So, <laughs> you know, it's so funny that you just said that because it's true. Like, I can run like my ass off for an hour, and you look at my watch. I'm like three hundred and forty six calories. I'm yeah. like. People overestimate the amount of calories that they actually burn. Yeah. And so they say, oh, you know what? I could eat this piece of cake now. But if they actually knew how much that cake had, it's yeah. like 50 runs, not yeah. one run, yes, right? Yes, exactly. It's so, it's so yeah. crazy, but we, our, our brains play tricks on us. Yeah. But I find also when you wear all these wearables, it actually gave me anxiety. Like, look at, oh, I got to look. Am I sleeping not well? Da, da, da. And it becomes like this gamifying thing where it actually like did me worse than yes. if I just like, like yeah. you know how I I know how I slept. Did I like, did I sleep from twelve to seven? When, do I feel rested? Do I not? Like whatever it is, you know what I mean? No, there's there's something disconcerting about waking up in the morning and going, oh, I slept great, and the watch goes, No, you didn't. <laughs> exactly right. But it's so. Why do you think all of this? Do you think it's just going to keep on going like this? No, but like, I think you said the word, the gamification of life. Yeah. People are, are they're into their devices. So yeah, so true. Um, you know, I uh, when we're in um, the south of France. Where we spend summers, we were there for three months this year, and so you're so fancy now. Pardon me. So oh yeah, fancy right. yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and 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 I do, uh, I do carry my phone with me, and we walk a lot, you know. But it's interesting that that how different uh, my phone shows the steps I did with my wife's phone, who walked the whole way with me. Right? Isn't that yeah, right? Yeah. Wow, yeah. it's very different, right? It's so it's so off that. It just it, it makes you think. Why am I even paying attention to this? It's right. like, but it's a game. So as some people would say, the treadmill at the gym yeah. shows you a relative number. It's only relative to you. So if you think that you are burning seven hundred calories, but you only burned four hundred, um, if if that seven hundred is more than the six hundred you burned yesterday, that you that right, you only. Exactly. Do ten thousand steps. I mean, it doesn't make a difference. He can wear one, you can wear one, and I, like your wife, we yeah. all have different steps doing yeah. the exact same thing. But at the end of the day, I mean, I'm not using it for anything beyond that. Even that to me is a lot. Right? No, my wife did a yoga class every day at our. We, so we had a yoga teacher come to our house in France. Yeah, and and she would have. We we always had were entertaining guests, so we ever always had anywhere from two to eight people that would be staying with us. And so the yoga teacher would come and do a yoga class in the morning, and and. Carrie would look at her watching. Well, I did twenty five hundred steps during yoga. 
Exactly. It makes no sense. <laughs> no. It makes no sense at no. all. No. So can I ask you another question? I want to know because you were a runner. Like, I, okay. So as you get older, you know, like you, I think I heard you mention somewhere that as you you said also. Runner's high. Like I'm trying to stop running. I'm sure a lot of people do, right? When I'm in your forties, whatever. Yeah. My body is like it's killing me. Yet you don't get that same high. What can you substitute it for? Because nothing I've found does that at like yeah. a runner's high. Yeah, it took. So. Oh, um... And for example, I, I ran 100 miles a week for seven years at, at the heyday. And then I kept, I, it, that was as a runner and then even as a triathlete, even though I was injured and I had running, yeah. running issues, I still ran 30 to 40 miles a week. I just couldn't run them. you know, do 13,000 steps or something. Yeah, like exactly, <laughs> right? But, but it's not the same. Do you, but do you get the same, where do you get that same endorphin rush? So the endorphin rush, I really want to do a, a study on this at some point because I think uh, the endorphin rush is the same as if, I don't know if you subscribe to any of these nature is brutal kind of things on the internet, but where, they, where they'll, you know, uh, people on safari will show uh, a lion eating a zebra that's still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went on a safari myself. Okay. I'm fascinated by okay. all of that. All yeah. Right. Um, I think the same thing happens to a runner in that um, this is a life-threatening situation. You're running, you're putting your body through this every day. Right. And so there are certain receptors in the brain. They call them you know, the endocannabinoid receptors. Uh, they call it endorphins or enkephalins, the natural um, morphine-like substances that your brain produces. And I think what what they're doing in an evolutionary context is they're just keeping you euphoric in an otherwise life-threatening situation. Yeah. And so we tend to seek these out because we can. Like our ancestors would not have run 10 miles a day every day. That's just stupid. That's right. a waste of resources and, and everything. Our ancestors, based on their native fitness, were able to run 10 miles maybe 20, chasing uh, you know, an antelope and tracking it and chasing it and sprinting and whatever. But the idea of running daily uh, didn't exist for a lot of reasons. Cut to modern life where we think that running is good for you and therefore we do it and we do it because we can do it and we can do it because we carbo load every day to be able to go out and do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Uh, and then we have these... Um, cushion shoes, these high-tech running mm -hmm. shoes that encourage us to heel strike. And so we become mm -hmm. terrible runners because we're heel striking. Look, humans have two basic gates, maybe a third in between, but the basic gate is walking, which is a heel toe, land on the heel, push off on the big toe, land on the heel, push off, and a sprint or a fast run, which is uh, typically a barefoot run because that's how we evolve, which is landing on the midfoot. Not on the heel, not striking on the heel, but landing on the midfoot. Now, you can, you can run slower than a sprint or faster than a walk and do a combination of those. But if you, if you were to do that on uh, the plains of Africa or the, even the, the, some of the tundra in northern Europe and you're barefoot, you'd still, you'd still be able to feel the ground underneath and you'd still be able to land. Your brain would get all the sensory input of how to wait, how to bend the foot, how to bend the knee, how to torque the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the ankle, how to twist, um, how to twist the hip, and how to, how to um, absorb all that shock with every footfall. You take that all away when you put on thick cushioned shoes, right. and now there's no sensory input in the foot, and now the shoes are encouraging you to run heel strike, heel strike, heel strike. And so, so many people are running, like when, when I started running in, in the 60s, um, I ran in Chuck Taylor's. And oh my God. I, could, I could run 40 miles a week max, and it's my feet that would say, no, you're done. You're done for the week. Um, and then along came uh, Onitsuka Tigers, which is the first sort of racing flat, and you could run 40 miles a week or maybe 50. 
And then when Bill Bowerman went to Phil Knight and said, hey, I got this guy, this runner, Kenny Moore. He's one of the, he could be one of the best in the world, but he, his, his shoes won't let him run more than 80 miles a week. Can we build a shoe that'll let him run 130 miles a week? And that's the, the origin of the thick running shoe was this thing that would let some of the early oh, wow. um, Nike runners put in more miles and train harder and be able to race against world-class athletes. Well, that's if you're a great runner. But then as the rest of the country began jumping on the running boom and thinking that because Ken Cooper wrote a book in 1968 called Aerobics, the more you run, the better it is for your heart. And so everybody became a runner in the 70s. And and they became pretty bad runners. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they started doing... And, and so this, this heel running, landing on your heel and rolling over became the way most people sort of learned how to run. So what that does is that encourages bad form. Um, it pushes pushes all of the stress away from the mm-hmm. foot and up to the knee and up to the hip and lower back. Um, and in my case, uh, the hip. So I have uh, bone on bone in my hip now from all of the years all of running. The, yeah. Uh, you ever got a hip replacement? Um, got one. I'm thinking about scheduling one fairly soon. I'm putting it off as long as I can. But yeah. 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 Wow. And the, no, I was going to say, well, my first question was, how do you replace the endorphins? So the endorphins, so the endorphin. so we got to the point where people were running daily because they got this endorphin yeah, that rush. they thought was good for them. And and the classic example oh, is the is the ex-heroin addict who becomes a running. It's not necessarily good. It's it's fine, but it's I think evolutionarily it's not serving the same purpose we think it is. Oh, I see what you're saying. But if you're so used to it, so you said that over time it'll just you won't need it as much the less you do it. Or you find other you you get in the cold plunge. You know, I, know, I, I uh, also like you. I'm not. Yeah. You know, crazy. <laughs> you know, or you do the sauna, or you do a heavy lifting day, and you get the same. But heavy rush. lifting to me doesn't give me the same. I still do it. I don't yeah. get the same. Yeah. Thing. So, this is going to be a therapy session as well. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, what is it about the running? What do you think you crave about the running? I think because the a, rush is not. It's not. That doesn't cut it. With I me. think it's the sweat. Like when I sweat like that. Yeah. I sweat when I do weights like that or whatever else. Yeah. And like just be able. I, it's my form of meditation, right? Because I'm not a meditator. Yeah. Right? I, yeah. I, but that's how I. Th- I think of. I think of my best thing. Running versus walking. Dr. Mark. No, no. So walking is probably the best thing a human being can do. The best single, best exercise. Look, we're bipedal. We are designed. We're built to walk. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about writing this book, Born to Walk, instead of Born to Run. Why don't I, you do that? Well, I'm. we, we are. Okay. So, um, but the idea is that, like, how fast can you walk? If you're walking normally, at a, and somebody says, okay, let's walk to Century City, you know. Do, you know and, okay, and, I can walk to Beverly Hills from here yeah? in 30 minutes. Okay, what, how many, 32. Like, like how many miles is that? Two, Two. yeah. All right, so, you're, so you're running, so you're walking 16 minute miles. Is that bad? No, you're walking, that's great. 16 yeah. minute miles is pretty fast. And I could probably go faster if I wasn't on my phone and distracted. Not much. Let's just say you could. Yeah. Let's say not you could. by a lot. Maybe but two let's, no. But this is my point. Let's say you could walk fifteen or fourteen minute miles. Yeah. Can you run seven minute miles for that long? No. Why not? I could. It's I guess. only twice as fast. It's you're, that's my point. Is most people can only run at best only twice as fast as they can walk. Not three times as fast. Not four times as fast. At best, only twice as fast. So if I said. Instead of a half hour run, why don't you do a one hour walk, cover the
walking to Beverly Hills. You got right. <laughs> but so that's that's where the whole idea of minimalist shoes, wide, thin, flat, flexible shoes come in. You want to feel the ground. You want to feel every time you step on a root or a rock. You want the toes to articulate. You want the toes that's to, true. yeah. You want to feel the ground underneath you. So that shoe you have right there is only point. It's it's point nine centimeters. It's nine millimeters thick. So that feels, it's got just enough cushion so that when you walk on concrete, you don't get a, a bone bruise. Right. And I, that was one of the first things I looked at when I was creating these shoes was how, how could we make these suitable for walking 10 miles in the urban jungle? Because I can walk to Beverly Hills. And Absol I, I absolutely. Can do 30 and I want walk. you to. And I want you to. I'm going to do yeah. it today, but I can't get my toes in here. Well, we're going to have to work on that. The, I know. the reason you can't get your toes in there is because you've scrunched your feet together for so many years yeah. in, in those. Hot little heels of yours, uh, and those running shoes, and everything else, um, and so we need to we need to work on the toe splay, right? Because if you can imagine, if you took it to its its logical conclusion, a shoe this high off the ground and and with a narrow base is not far off from a stilt. Like, would you want to walk on stilts to you know? And how much no. you know? But as opposed to if you walked barefoot or you've walked in minimal shoes and you were able to splay your toes out and feel everything and feel every toe working and work all the small muscles of your feet, you, your feet would get stronger, your ankles would get stronger, so you'd be less inclined to, to roll them. Um, and then one of the great comments we're getting from a lot of people is how, how all the muscles up the leg, up the kinetic chain of the leg, are benefiting more from the ground feel. Really? Yeah, especially weightlifters. Guys... are benefiting from my wearing the paluvas because of the toe splay, because of the- 100%. In fact, actually, when I do my lower, when I do my weights and stuff like that, I take off my shoes. Yeah. And I do my deadlifts and my things. And my feet are so weak, like my, they wobble. My yes, ankles are wobbling. Yes, you can't have that. It's you can't terrible. have that. So I can just wear these. Uh, totally. And, and the idea behind these is don't run in them yet. I mean, you know, years down the road, you could. But walk in them, spend the day in them. And we have, we have different models for, uh, you know, driving for, for doing errands, for picking the kids up at school, like for going those. out to dinner. These are, these are the leather, uh, lace ups for, you know, weddings and funerals. Can you please send those to me? I will wear those. <laughs> okay. Those are the nicest ones I've seen. Okay. I mean, these ones though, like for, so you're telling, it's more of, again, it's all psychological. Like I have to get used to the feeling that I don't have that support in the arch, right? Like, Yes, you do. So it's, like, it's all psychological. It's all psychological. And yeah. so you spend, you know, you, you, you wear these around the house the first day for yeah. an hour, and then you take them off. And then the next day for two hours. And then the third day you walk to Beverly Hills, the two miles in them. Yeah. You know, I'm going well, to do that tonight. Okay. And then, let me, so where are they being sold? Are they just on your website? Just on the website for now. Through the newsletter? Uh, no. So, so Mark Staley Apple is, is owned by Kraft. So stop it. Yeah, yeah. So I still write for it, and I still, but it's but Kraft acquired, you know, they they acquired the the food company. They required they acquired the. Uh, um, I bet you they bought you because of that newsletter oh, too. Well, I don't know about that. One hundred percent. That yeah. data, that newsletter, that yeah. database. Yeah. All so they got all the names of the people. That yeah, was so under, smart. That's what. Every Secret sauce. Yeah. Wow. So if you were, if you still write for them, we've, no, we've we've done pieces on. Can you Paloma. go? Can sure, you put can something in there? Sure, but not every day. You know, not not often. It's got to be. No, it's got to be like once it's, in a it's, while. It's a newsletter, and there's not a lot of advertising to begin with. with are you it. actually still at, like between you and me? Yeah. And maybe a couple people. Are you really writing that newsletter? Still? I have a team. I have a team of researchers and writers, and I write some of the stuff, and some of the stuff is, you know, that can be done by other people. Some of the heavy lifting by other people. I, that's what's done. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So then, what else are you working on? This kid. So this has been out for how long? This Paluva. Um, we launched in uh, March of this year. Okay. So you're pretty brand probably, new. Like, yeah, really yeah. new. Really new. Yeah. All right. So um, this. What else are you besides going to the south of France? Of course. What, yeah. el what else are you doing besides that? This. Um, what else are you up to? The book Born to Run or Born to Walk? Yeah. Are you really working on that yet, or you're so going so? To work I'm on always it? working on a book. And, always. Uh, yeah, and so I've got a, 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 a sort of an, a longevity book that I'm working on that is the anti Huberman Atia approach. Really? Which is what? Tell me what it is. It's it's more like 
How don't do, you, do all these things. How do you feel? Yeah, it's it's really it's based on common sense and a, being attuned to the body and how you feel versus how a device tells you or a blood test or a. How a do you? Scan. Okay, that's such a, okay. So I love that. So like, how do you? Because people like magic pills, yes, right? Yeah. And that's why a lot of pe- a lot of these people are very popular and these things are popular because people want to. You know, say, oh, it's th- I, oh, I can try this to get you yeah. know my secret body that I always wanted, or I can I can shave twenty years off of my age if I do this secret yeah. thing, right? Like once you tell people, like I wrote not like, not to bore you with my whole story, but back when uh, my first book was called No Gym Required, and I did a shoe that was a weighted shoe, right? And my whole my whole thing was basically giving people these simple solutions to be healthier and fit, which were really like basic stuff. Like I would say, like kind of similar to you. That's why I really like you know re- you resonated with me. I was like, do a squat, a push up, a lunge, a pull up, whatever. Basics. Like you don't have to rely on these crazy machines. You don't have to rely on this. Like you can do all these things. People didn't care. Yeah. They wanted the people. They were like very interested in all this other kooky stuff that yeah. was not even like helpful really it's just a money maker so how do you expect now you know 20 years later to try to tell people that's all nonsense you can just listen to yourself and use common sense people don't want to believe i'm not i'm not into the magic pill money maker me neither thing. so but people like i understand like but it. but i you know when when i made a mayonnaise at retail for 9.95 for a 12 ounce jar people said you're crazy no one's going to buy it it's like that they want Crunchy, salty, fatty, sweet. They want cheap. They want, you know, they it's want. True. And and I'm like, yeah, a lot of them do. But I bet there's some people who want who want this. So I write and I make product for the some people, for the some people who uh, are you know willing to suspend disbelief maybe a little bit and uh, put on a five toed shoe or who are willing to give up their wearables for an experiment that lasts a couple of weeks and uh, really forces them to look inward into how they feel or their thought process. Um, I don't, you know, I have, I have all the money I need to live the rest of my life luxuriously and I don't need to leave it to kids or grandkids. Kids. I'm just, I'm, I'm living my life, but I'm going to do it on my terms. And so, you know, I've always been ahead of the curve in some of this stuff, but my, one of my problems has been timing. I've been, I was, you know, 10 years ahead of the curve on uh, the seed oil thing. I started talking about it in, the, in 2007. Well, had I launched Primal Kitchen then, it would have been a failure because it took 10 years of educating the world mm-hmm. to, to get there, to be accepting of a, a, a very expensive mayonnaise that was demonstrably the best on the shelves and better for them, uh, beca- but because of the knowledge base that I'd built and the credibility and, you know, all of the other educational aspects of that, it, it worked. And do you think now people are ready to hear the next evolution of like, don't worry about wearing that whoop and that aura ring or whatever. I'm not, I'm just, whatever. You don't need that. Listen to yourself. Some, you, some people are. Some people. Some people, some people. I, all I need is some people. This all is, you need is some you know, people. Like, like, as I said on a recent podcast, I, I, like there's in, in the U.S. there's 330 million people or whatever the number yeah. is, and they all need shoes. Um, and some people are going to need Paluvas and I only need a million people to be a very successful company. I love that line. Some people, it's so true, right? You just need some people. Yeah. And I want people, I want my people. I don't want the people who don't want to listen and don't want to, you know, they're not willing to educate themselves and they're still stuck in, in the old mentality. That's, they're not my people. They're not. And I don't, I'm not, I don't even pretend to want to convince them to come over to my side. I want to talk to people that want to listen. I mean, yeah, how did, and I totally agree with you, but I'm wondering, what do you think it is about you? Because a lot of people can talk stuff and like people don't listen, right? Like yeah. obviously they're listening to you. Like at the beginning of everything, like you did the letter, I mean, the the newsletter, like was it, like what, what was the quality that you think got to build a community in the first place, right? Because even though you were an early adopter, why else do you think that you had the success that you did? I mean, I think it was real authenticity. Uh, we, we, we did research and we didn't um, make outlandish claims without at least backing it with research. But I mean, I was one of the early guys, you know, fat is not bad. Saturated fat's not the mm-hmm. reason for heart that. disease. Cholesterol is not the bad, the bad guy people think it is. Um, and... I, people appreciated that I 
stuck with a lot of that over the years. I changed my mind in some areas. But they appreciate that I changed my mind when, with, in the face of, of new evidence or new information. Are you a big smoothie guy? No, never. Really? Yeah, because it's like that's another one of these big trends that are. Do you yeah, think it's a or, myth that they're so healthy for you? No, it's a myth. Yeah, it's a, I would say I would say, you know, it's a convenient way to get calories in. Great. I'd rather eat my calories. I'd rather cr- chew and crunch and get the mouth feel and get the experience. And one of the things again we talked about, like when is it time to finish eating? Well, when I've had the full gustatory experience and I'm no longer hungry for the next bite. If I'm slamming down a, a 20 ounce smoothly and and I you know in my mind it's like okay this is a there's an intention behind completing the the, the consumption of this smoothie so I'll just whether or not I'm any thirstier or hungrier I'm going to I'm going to finish it yeah, yeah. and it's so you lose you lose touch with the reality of like when is it time to stop yeah. with a smoothie and you know I don't a lot of people live by their smoothies they have a you know breakfast smoothie and um, a lunch smoothie, yeah, it's very popular. You know, do you ever go to Sun Life Organics for for a twenty dollars smoothie? For, yeah, I'm just uh, saying oh, for the God. billionaire smoothie. No, and Khalil's a good friend of mine, oh. and I'm like, I, I've I, I cannot. It's the principle alone yes. that I will not allow me to do that. Like, yeah. if I can go to Masters and get a steak for the same price, yeah. it's like Era One. Yeah, right. Like Era One's like a twenty five dollars smoothie. You know, me and my girlfriend laughed. We went there last night because we had dinner. I had for, yeah. uh, dinner with my friend. Um, and we walked to Arrow One, and I very rarely do this because yeah. it's like insults my intelligence. Forty-seven dollars for my dinner, which was a little thing. I had yeah. kelp noodles, yeah. and 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 some sweet potatoes, and a little salmon bite that was like this big. Anywhere else in the world, it would have been a nine ninety nine dinner. Right, forty-seven dollars. I thought I was like. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe the, it, like the audacity that yeah. they have. Yeah. And the place is full. You oh, can't I know. Even... My son ate there last night. We brought something home from Erewhon last night. Right? Same thing, yeah. And like the yeah. audacity. And the people are like standing in line. Like you think they're yeah. giving something away. Yeah. By the way, I didn't mean to diss uh, Sun Life and Khalil. No, you're he's not done, dissing he's, anything. No, he's done a great job and he's a great friend of mine. But I just thought there's an example of like, and I don't even care what the price is on it. It's just... Uh, th- that amount of sugar, that you know, dates and whatever. Do you remember it is? Jamba Juice? Of course. Okay, yeah. it's basically I, a fancier Jamba yeah, Juice yeah. with like you know, organ the word organic and some healthier things, yeah. but you can still OD on healthy foods yes. with with calories especially and sugar. Especially juice, especially juice. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like yeah. these are all just fancy Jamba I, Juices. No, I, we in in the Primal Blueprint, which came out it was written in two thousand nine, came out in two thousand ten. One of the opening scenes is is you know going to Jamba Juice, yeah. the uh, um, the Cindy Core getting getting off the spin bike and going to Jamba Juice and, <laughs> yes. and having two hundred grams of of uh, sugar to replenish the you know the, the one the, gram the, that the, she actually whatever burned it was off. She, she actually burned off yeah it's so true it's so crazy I mean anyway I know that we I've I've we've been going on and on I don't know how long this sure podcast call. is but I have to say that. Um, I am going to try these shoes. I am going to walk to oh, Beverly I'm going to make Hills. Sure. Oh, trust me, and I'm going to make sure you send me those. Okay. So uh, we both can like you know, follow up on each sure. other. Um, and where do people like find? Like, where do people find more information about you? Okay. So um, you know, Mark's Daily Apple is the blog. Been around for a long time. Yeah. Can they go to craft.com uh, for no, that? No, 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 no. It's Mark's Daily Apple. Um, and uh, Wear Paluva, W E A R P E L U V A. Okay. Is the Instagram site for the shoes, and then. Paluva.com is where they can buy the shoes. Buy shoes. Uh, well, this is great. Would you come back on the podcast sometime next time yeah, you're in LA? Of course. This was amazing. I want to, I would say, let's work out together, but you don't run anymore. You don't do all, I don't have a fat bike. So unfortunately, I guess. We'd have to do deadlifts or something. Yeah, like a deadlift <laughs> or something. Exactly. This has been so fun. I really appreciate being on the podcast. And I think we're, I'm, you're done. You can, okay. you can go home now. <laughs> Thanks, <Jennifer. laughs> Thank you. Thank you.